Good, uh, good morning to everybody. Um, it's a delight to be here. Um, I do actually come to Wales quite a lot. So most of my family hails from North Wales. Um, but I was brought up in England and I haven't been to North Wales for a long time, though, I have to say. Um, and it's normally visiting, well, it's always visiting family on family reasons. So it's very nice to come here actually to talk about farming and talk about the food industry. My background in the 90s was Chief Economist at the, um, the NFU, so it was very much on the farming side and the uh, political side, I guess. But for the last 10 years or more, worked in the food industry really much more and on the commercial side. So I've sort of had 20 years on, on either side of that equation, I suppose. And I agree with one thing the Minister said at the beginning, which was that I'm absolutely an optimist too. I think it's my 20, 25 years in the industry, it's the most exciting and best time in the, in the, in the, in the farming industry at any, any point in that journey. My job today, um, I've been asked to talk about a, a global perspective on food and farming businesses. I think it in one sense is to try and move the discussion from politics to the market. And that's what I hope to try and do. Um, and I want to talk around uh, global challenges that have been put up here. And the way I was going to do that was to um, ask a question. Um, and that question is, should come up in a second, has the way we consume, produce and procure food <coughs> changed forever? And this is very much about the markets and thinking around the marketplace for food. Um, and I believe it probably has or is changing um, in a way that is very different to the past. And what I want to do in the next 20 minutes or so is try and explore that and explain why, why I think that is the case. Where I have to start briefly, um, a really important factor in all this, which hasn't really been touched on this morning very much, is about the economy. I'm going to put a graph up here. It is the most complicated graph. It comes first, but there are three simple messages. So don't worry too much about the fact that it's, it's a, a complicated graph. What it's looking at is the recessions that have occurred in the last century within the UK. And it's looking at each of those recessions, comparing them to each other, so that you can see how the economy fared. And this black line here is the current period that we're in. And it's five years, basically, now since the recession started back in 2008. What I want to do is just bring out three clear points um, from that for you. The first one is that back in 2008-9, we did have a deep recession. The UK economy shrunk by between 7 and 8 percent. That is a lot. Um, not quite as much as it did in the 1930s, but it's still a very deep recession. The real story, though, is what's happened after that. And that is that if you follow this black line along here, you can basically see for the last three years, all it's done is go flat. You hear all these, somebody, I think the minister or somebody mentioned this morning about the, la the last GDP figures, 0.3 down, the ones before or up. It doesn't mean much. The reality is, the story is simply that the economy in the UK has been flat as a pancake for about three years. Hopefully, it's looking like it might be improving somewhat coming into this year, but that is a big change. It is a very unusual time for the economy for three years not to go up and not to go down. And just to put that again in perspective, where we are now, five years after the start of the economy, the start of the recession, is the UK economy is still 3% smaller than it was back in 2008 at the start of the recession. The other recession that many people here would have experienced is the one 20 years ago in the early 1990s. At the same point after the start of that recession, the economy was actually it's slightly bigger than that now. It was about 9% larger. So what's just we've been going through in the last few years is completely different to the recession that we had 20 years ago. I think that's the starting point. And why is that important? Well, a couple of reasons I want, want to sort of try and bring out. I don't know where I meant to point this actually to make it work. There we go. Um, first one is for consumers. We're all in the food industry, we're producing food for consumers. And a simple message from this. Prior to 2008, very simply, for people who were living in the UK, very broadly, average inflation was running at about 2 or 2.5%. <coughs> average earnings were running at about 4 or 4.5%. Happiness. Roughly what's happened in the last five years is average inflation has been running around 4% or so, and average earnings have been running at less than 2%, maybe close to 1% unhappiness. And that basically, in many ways, describes what's happening to consumers. And consumers make up 70% of the UK economy. And while this is just starting to close, because inflation has come down so much, somewhat, it just describes, I think, in one picture, it describes why the picture of people going into shops, people buying food for the last five years, has been so different to what we've known for the 20 or 30 years prior to that. The other big picture is this, the other one, and this is trying to look at it from a more global point of view. If you remember the number I just gave you before, the UK economy is 3% smaller now than it was five years ago at the start of the recession. 
How do we compare that? I compared it to the last recession. If you compare this to, say, America and to Germany, they're doing a bit better. They're about 2 or 3% bigger now, their economies are, than at the start in 2008. If you look in Asia, Asian economies overall have grown by about a third in that period. If you look at China, we've got 3% smaller, and just in that five-year period, China has got 50% bigger. I used to say, when people asked me, that this graph described the major economic event that would happen in my lifetime, which was that up until around 2000, if you talked about the world economy, you were talking about the Western world, because 80% of the world economy was in the Western world. That was what you were talking about. You can basically see what's been happening here is that massive growth in the developed world and stagnation over the last five years are bringing these two lines rapidly together. And just that 50% versus minus 3% shows it's not something happening over a lifetime, it's something happening over a decade. The switch from west to east is, a, is an absolute ph phenomenal sort of effect within the world economy. And moving back towards our industry, this has a couple of really big important implications. One for what's happening to food demand, and on the back of that, what's happening to demand for commodities. China is massively dominant in the world. There's almost a sucking noise that has been in the last 10 years as commodities around the world have been heading towards China. Um, and it is that there's obviously a whole range of countries that are important, but China is just so dominant um, within that sort of mix. And heading then towards food, trying to bring this sort of together. The perfect storm was mentioned this morning. I think the perfect storm was actually something that was um, picked up by Sir John Beddington, to be fair, who's the government chief scientist. And when he came in about four years ago now, I think, he very, very early on in his, in his tenure as a uh, government chief scientist came out with a view that the, the, the impacts of what's happening in the food industry are almost as great for society as what's happening in terms of climate change. And he drew this little picture, which I find very useful to sort of summarise his arguments, which is that there's a lot of agreement now that globally demand for food is going to grow strongly in the next few years. 50% increase by 2030. The important thing is that this is going to happen, though, at a time when there's going to be increased demand for energy, increased demand for water to be able to satisfy that, but at a time when those resources are potentially becoming more limited. And all of that occurring at a time when this impacts on climate change, we think, possibly, and climate change possibly links on agriculture and food production. And that was his definition of the sort of the perfect storm that we're looking at over the next 10 or 15 years. I think one point with this story that I mean people will be you know, well aware of the story, one point that tends to get caught up in the papers is people always focus on this bit, which is the increase in food, the increased demand. See, there isn't much argument about that. Unless there's a, a, a catastrophe with the world economy or something catastrophic happens with the world population, this is fairly well set to happen. The thing that's really volatile, both short term and longer term, is supply. That's the bit that is really uncertain, is where the supply going to come from? The increase that we're talking about here in food demand is actually no bigger in the next 40 years than was achieved in the last 40 years. It's just that, looking forward, some of those constraints are rather greater than perhaps we've had in the past. And that brings me back, therefore, to my question. Has the way we consume, produce and procure food changed for good? And I want to just look at those three things in order. So if I start with producing, in other words, at the agricultural end, and just draw a picture here for you. I'm going to use wheat prices because looking globally, and I want to look over a long term here, I'm going to look over a century just to try and look at what's happened to the world food market and the food market that everybody here sells into. And wheat, we can get a century worth of data, and it also tends to, more than any other market, the grain market impacts on, on, on dairy, on meat markets, on, on all the other markets. And I'm not going to go through this in detail. It's a quick story, hopefully, if I can get this buzzer to work. Um, that's the first 70 years already done from here to here. Okay? We kind of we moved, moved through that very quickly, that first 70 years. There were quite a, uh, um, um, quite a lot of things happening in that period, and markets went up and down. But the key point just to point is that in the early 1970s, the price of wheat was almost exactly where it was 70 years earlier. So in real terms, across the world, the real price of wheat after inflation had fallen considerably over that period. In the early 1970s, there was something that got sort of called the Great Grain Robbery, and there's also the 1970s oil shock. And what we saw was the nominal price of food measured here by grain shooting upwards, quadrupling in very short order. The Russians cornered the market on grain, and oil prices were shooting up. And there was a big jump in the early 1970s. 
But what you can equally see is that in the period, last 30, 35 years after that, where most people here would have been developing their business, what happened was it just moved sideways again. And in fact, inflation at that time was running at around 70, sorry, 25 to 30%. So in real terms, again, what happened throughout the whole of this period was in real terms, prices were coming down. The real thing was the supply and demand balance in the world, productivity was always slightly ahead of demand, and prices for agricultural and food edged ever lower. What we've seen in the last five years is another, the second big jump in the century, really, in terms of non, non, nominal prices. What's been called the perfect storm, and I think um, increasingly um, many people believe, a permanent shift upward in prices. But the critical difference is, we're worried these days if inflation is running at 3% rather than 2%. So in real terms, this is the first time in a century that we've had a major upward shift in prices in real terms that are likely to be here for the long term. And I think that has, in terms of where farmers are, that has, has huge implications because after a century, really, of it going downwards in real terms and the supply and demand balance being in one direction, there is a lot of evidence starting to build that, that is starting to tilt um, in the opposite direction. Supply, I said, was the really key thing here. I'm just going to put one example up here because it's just a stark one. If you're looking, this is for wheat and barley, looking in the UK, and you think about how productivity has grown over a period. The last two harvests, this har the harvest we've just had, difficult one, and the harvest before, the average wheat yield in the UK was lower than it was at the peak in the 1980s. And you can easily see just by looking at that graph in the last 15 years, average wheat yields have not increased in the UK at all. <coughs> so it's the supply side for a whole range of reasons that have started to impact, um, I think, on, on that balance. Um, the demand side is, 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 is fairly well set. Another change on the production side, and one that's been talked about a lot this morning, really, so far, which has been subsidies. We talked about it a lot last night when I met people, and really, for the first hour and a half this morning, we've talked about subsidies all morning. Um, it's, it's, it's almost like a trip to the past for me, because it's what I did in the 1990s. I never do it anymore, never ever talk about it with, with the companies I work with. But I just find this um, is my take, looking from the outside, an interesting graph. And what it's just looking at for the UK is the level of subsidy that goes into agriculture as a proportion of total income from farming. And if you look at this first period, if you look at this first period here, from 1990 through to sort of 2000, that was my career at the NFU, I spent my time going over to Brussels, negotiating and working on deals to get more agri money compensation and work on subsidies. And it was really important, because subsidies at their peak got to around 150% of the entirety of income coming from farming. But if you look what's happened over the last 10 years, What's slowly been happening is that trend has been moving in the other direction. And really what's driven it is prices have gone up, and subsidies have probably not gone down in normal terms, but they have in real terms. And where we're moving to, and there's a clear line here, is that when you're looking at farm businesses, in terms of the proportion of where the wheat is coming from, it's been heading in one direction here. And I've heard absolutely nothing this morning which would persuade me that that line is going to do anything other than what I put on there with that red line. Because not only will you have inflation cutting away those subsidies in the next decade, but they've actually just stood on the stage and told you this morning, in nominal terms, they're probably going to get cut for a budget cut. So if you're thinking about what farming will look like in 10 years' time, whatever the detail of the subsidy arrangements are, if you're thinking about where your income is going to come from, a vast majority of it is going to come from the market, which is very different to the way place it was in the past. And my message, therefore, on this one would be, that's a big change going on, and if you're in business over the next 10 years, you, you really need to, be, need to be thinking about that. The fast one, last one on, on the production side, which I think has changed, and I think really positively is this, just very briefly, it looks at productivity in UK agriculture. And again, if you go back to the 1990s, it wasn't a very positive story, really. Actually, all of those lines, as you can see, were together. Productivity was very flat, production was very flat, input usage was very flat. What's happened in the last 10 to 15 years is that productivity has increased quite significantly across agriculture. A bit of an untold story, really, and a very positive one. What's happened, though, is output has just fallen a little bit. And what's really happened is the volume of inputs has fallen. Over that period, the volume of, of nitrogen, for example, and fertiliser going into farming has fallen by about 35%. Now, there's a range of reasons for that. And my suspicion is, you know better than I, but my suspicion is that regulation has played a part but the real driver has actually been, as ever, the market and the cost of these things. Oil prices have gone up, fertilizers become more expensive, and people react on the back of that. It is around nitrogen that, and there are other bits of fertilizer that we have to think about. 
But it is a positive story. The question going forward is, how do we keep this productivity line going upwards? Is it forever pushing this volume of inputs down? I'm not sure it can be. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's a good story so far, I think, in terms of farming. So has things, have things changed for, for farming? Well, there was no change in that sort of period. The same with less in that period. I think the challenge for the future is how we keep, as I say, that red, that red line going forward. So my question, has the way we produce change? Yes. Supply and demand, after a century of going this way, has tipped in the other direction. Subsidy is becoming much less important in terms of a proportion of income, and within 10 years, we'll be a minority, a small minority, of most farmers' incomes within the UK. And productivity is increasing, as people are really looking at their costs and what's going in, as well as what's coming out. I'm rushing through, because I know we have a, a, a limited time, but I want to move on to the second bit then, and the crucial bit, this is where I normally focus actually, which is around consumption. Those big economic global challenges, how are they affecting consumption, the consumers and the people who eat our food? Well, those increases that um, I was talking around reflect in food prices. What this is, is just looking at food inflation over the last sort of five years or so. Um, we have a model that predicts food inflation going forward, which is what you can see at the end here. But there's been a simple story. 2008-9 in the UK, retail food inflation peaked at about 12 or 13 percent. Food was expensive. It was a really big issue, if you remember, in the news a lot around food prices. 2011, the second peak, peaked at about 7 percent, quite a lot lower. Our forecast is that the current rise that is just underway at the moment will probably peak in the late summer or autumn of this year at around 4 to 4.5%, so lower again. So positive in that sense, and part of the reason for that is a, a, a big fall in the pound to drive some of this going up. But this is the story, and if you've got one graph that you take away from my presentation, this is the one to take away. So if you turn that into food prices, it gives you a dramatic picture. And I could continue this red line here going backwards up like this. For a consumer, the last several decades, the experience consumers have had, it's different from year to year, but broadly, in real terms, food got cheaper every year, decade after decade. And that's what people got used to. If you bought food, and all of us buy food, everybody in the country buys food, this is the environment in which we were operating. And that was the environment in which the food industry and the agricultural industry was operating. There was a big price shock here in 2008, but the really interesting thing to look at actually is what, again, what's happened since then. Because what's starting to appear is a new trend in real food prices within the UK, and it's one that is moving upwards rather than moving downwards. And that is a totally different position than we've been in for decades within the UK in terms of the food market and in, in terms of consumers. And it's having a big impact on consumers. Just a few things to flash up. This is some research that's um, been done with consumers. 53% of consumers claim to be focusing more and spending more time on only buying what they need. In other words, there are real indications now trying to reduce wastage in terms of consumers. 74% monitoring the price. Big thing, I haven't got time to talk about it, digital, massive within the retail industry, the influence of the introduction of digital having. It's so much easier for consumers now to compare prices. You can see what the price of a pint of milk is in that supermarket, and that supermarket, and that supermarket, just standing by the price, just by standing by the milk counter. Information for consumers has become much, much more readily available. Um, <laughs> And on top of that, and this is the, the difficult one when you're in the food manufacturing industry, everybody is now out looking for discounts, looking for promotions, and looking for something that's on special offer. This has been a massive change that's happened in the last few years, which I'll, I'll comment on in a second, but just to sort of summarise that. For retailers, they love to see volume growth, and we all seem to love to see volume growth. For much of the last two years in the UK retail food market, we've actually seen volume declines for food. And that is unprecedented for the UK food market. We've got a growing population in the UK, and yet we're actually selling less food. So my stuff about consumers and the fact that it's changed for consumers is very definitely being reflected in what consumers do, because we're buying less food. That's a very uncomfortable place, for, certainly for retailers to be at. Um, consumers are changing their behaviour, as I've said, and there's, there's a list of things, making lists. I'll quick fl flip through these, because I've, I've touched on a few of these. Material reducing waste, analysing um, um, brands versus private label, being more promiscuous because of promotions and the like, reappraising the me versus them. I think things like the healthy eating agenda has done well through the recession. Other things such as green and organic have done less well through the recession. You might call that the me versus them. But the point to get to quickly on this particular slide, um, given the time, is this. For supermarkets, life has become much more difficult. 
Because in a world where volumes have been falling, that is a much more difficult place to be. And everybody has seen, I mean, just even the likes of Tesco's putting out profit warnings in the last sort of 18 months. It has become a much more difficult sort of operating environment. And this filters down through the food chain. What's happening to consumers is filtering down through the food chain. And this bit up here about discounting is really interesting because what seems to be happening is food price increases are being passed through the food chain. People are getting unit case price increases through, but then people are buying less of it, which is why we've gone from about 20 to 25 percent of food on, on promotion in the UK to close to 40 percent on promotion. For some big brands, they're permanently at sort of 70 or 80 percent promotion because you can get your price increase through, but then nobody buys the stuff. So you have to put it on promotion to get the volume to be able to push it through, which is an odd sort of dynamic that we've, we've got in the food industry at the moment. So the way that we consume food, I believe, has also changed. And at the moment, it doesn't look dramatically like that's going to change. I think the economy will improve a little bit this year, but for consumers, there is still a lot of debt out there, and it's going to be a long haul coming back to sort of where we were. The last bit, and this is the bit that I do as a living really, is thinking about what I call procurement. In other words, how does the food industry and the agriculture industry link together? How does the raw material flow through that chain? And how, how has it changed? And I go back to the, the big change, because this is the big thing that's changed for food manufacturers and processors. Most people have built their business strategy over many decades on the assumption that over a number of years that your raw material cost was going to fall. If you could keep your output price roughly level over a number of years, your raw material cost would fall, your margins would increase. A very simplified analogy of it, but that's roughly where we were. I think a lot of people are now of the view that actually moving forward, that could be rather different. And over the next 20 years or so, maybe you're going to see those raw material prices rising. And not only that, something we haven't talked at all about today is the increased volatility that we've seen in prices. And those are really important for those people in the middle in terms of the the, um, the, the manufacturers and the processors. We work for a whole range of sort of companies. These are the sorts of companies that these are all our clients that I work with in terms of manufacturing processing. And I'm going to again simplify the message in terms of raw materials that we get. And we call it the supply challenge. Um, and, and there's sort of three elements of this. The first one, and the one that um, all sort of um, any food manufacturer is most scared of, is security of supply, if it's real. Because if you've got a lot of money tied up in, in a facility somewhere, the one thing you don't want is to have, not have product thrown through it. And increasingly, um, security supply is becoming a real issue. And you only have to look at a few places. Just look at the dairy industry. Five or six years ago, liquid milk was traded completely differently to the way it is today. And retailers have put their arms around liquid milk within the UK. And it's been driven by fears around security and supply. I rather suspect that some of the overtures into the meat sector in the, in the last six months or so are probably starting to head in this direction as well. But if you know that's the biggest one of all, if security and supply is really threatened, it's important. A few years ago, five, six years ago, 40% of wheat grown in the UK was group threes. Last year it was 11%. Some businesses, their entire intake is on group three wheats, and you suddenly get very worried when you see it from 40% to, to 11% over, over that sort of period. <coughs> this is the one that they actually, although they're fearless, most, this is the one that most focused on, and that is around stability and dealing with volatility. A huge issue for food manufacturers. You've suddenly got your output price and the pressure from the consumer getting very tight, and suddenly, you know, your wheat price doubles overnight. Um, it's a really tricky place to be in, and we shouldn't forget that margins in food processing, the bit in the middle, are at their lowest levels this last year, in 15 years. It is quite a tricky place to, to be operating. The third leg of it, that is very important in the long term, and um, somewhere comes behind, but I tend to still find that uh, the commercial end, when you're talking to the commercial players, not, it comes well behind these issues, is the longer term sustainability issues, the drive towards the environmental and social factors that are important in sustainability. But a combination of these things, I think, are becoming very important for food companies. And that has implications for procurement. So very quickly, if I whiz through, the security of supply, what we're seeing are more relationships developing between the food industry and the farming industry because of that drive towards security of supply. Similarly, on price stability and trying to deal with that, increasingly there are ways that have been trying to look at to manage that risk across the length of the chain. If you look at the development of contracts, again in mill, just look at the development of contracts and how those have changed so rapidly in the last few years in the dairy sector. It's happening in potatoes, it's happening in cereals, maybe it's just starting to happen in the, in the meat sector. And sustainability as well. I mean, the interesting one there, of course, is that retailers all have desires to, 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 to move forward in this area, but you really can't do very, you can do a lot of stuff very quickly in your store, but to really make a difference here, you have to do it on farm. 
because it's at the farm end where, where so much of this happens. My point out of all this is this, and then I'll just come on to my last few examples and finish. I think because of these changes, a lot of opportunities are arising at the interface between the food industry and the farming industry. And because of the security of supply, the risk, the volatility, um, a more collaborative and strategic approach is definitely developing between the food industry and the farming industry in this country. And I was going to finish on just giving you three very quick cases of three businesses that we've helped set up in the last few years to try and deal with this. And it just brings out one, one message for you. We've been working with United Biscuits for about five or six years now. We work on grain large now. We originally started on potatoes. We've actually just split this business and it's been sold to, sold to some Germans. But um, we, we helped a group of farmers set up a new business, a cooperative, that supplies the big facility going into McCoy's up in Teesside. Um, this was about four, four or five years ago. They were importing previously. It was around trying to find that interface of how do you bring farmers together and how do you interface them with the company. In that case, it was a cooperative that was set up. And it was a company that very much wanted to try and allay some of these concerns. There, I would say, the impetus came from the company. And that's kind of related to the point I want to make. This second, second example is another one that we work with, a, a, a company called Cambrain. It's the largest farmer-owned grain storage business in the UK. Store about half a million tonnes now. There are four big stores across the centre of central band of England. Um, we've helped them build their strategy over the last five or six years, and they now have a contract for instance that all in-house bread to be buy in Sainsbury's anywhere in the UK is, comes from all 100% British wheat from this group of farmers. Sainsbury's have made a long-term commitment towards that, and if you buy bread in Sainsbury's, that's where it's coming from, is this group of farmers sat across the central belt of England now. Um, that was driven by farmers. That was the farmers who got together. They invested off farm into storage, and then they decided they wanted to take some control of their supply chain. They needed Sainsbury's to get the deal, but it was absolutely driven by farmers. And this was sort of a middle one, actually, with Unilever and Coleman's. Nobody would ever know. I had no idea when we got involved here four or five years ago that actually it looked like Coleman's English mustard wasn't going to have any English mustard in it very soon. Because people didn't grow it, you didn't make any money at it. And there were very few actual growers left. So we did the same thing then, really. Set up a small cooperative, get the farms together, put them in a business where they could work together and then interact with the company better. Invest in, uh, they've since invested in storage and invested into cleaning equipment. But what it's meant is now it's secured for them a market and it's secured for Unilever, a supply of British mustard, which is now growing in proportion. And I guess it's secured for all of us that when we have Coleman's mustard, which I guess probably all of us do at some stage, it's actually English mustard rather than come from somewhere else around the world. Three examples of what we did. I wanted to do that just to show that I think one of the biggest issues facing the farming and food industry over here is if you look around all the other countries around the UK, this interface is really important. But if you look in Ireland, if you look in Denmark, if you look in Holland, if you look in France, farmers have major investments in cooperatives and other vehicles around the rest of, uh, around the rest of agriculture. We are the odd ones out. The UK are the odd ones out. And what's happening at the moment is that void is being filled by companies, food companies coming down and organising farmers for them. And I think that can work really well, and that's who pays me a lot of the time, is to go out and do that, and that's what we do. The message I would just give, and always try and talk to everybody about, is the people who do the doing ultimately will get the reward. And who drives that process is really, really important, I think. Just to come to an end then, uh, last slide, um, key factors in terms of farming come right back all the list to profitability. Um, global prices, exchange rates, interest rates, they've always been the most important issues when it comes to looking at what's happened to farm income and what happens to your farms. How much influence do you have on all of those? Virtually none. The one that most people talk about, and we did it again this morning, was subsidy. Really, really important. I think back in the 90s, it was absolutely dominant. It's becoming, I've got a question mark there, that's wrong. It is becoming less important. And in five or 10 years time, it will be a minority part of the income coming into most farms. It is less important. You have a bit more influence there, through farmers' unions and the influence you, know, you can impact on people here this morning. Productivity growth, there's some of the things I mentioned around that. Managing volatility and positioning yourself within supply chains to create value, most importantly, then to capture it, which is also very important. Absolutely, these are becoming more important. And absolutely, this is in the gift of the people who want to do it. So my message at the end here on this would be, focus on these things. Because these things are the things you can do something about. These things are really important. This one, well, you let the unions and the others do the job for you. But this is really, really, on an individual basis, this is where it goes. And it's the market that's going to drive that um, in, in, in the future. 
To sum up, I asked the question at the beginning, have things changed? And I think they're changing fast and they're changing permanently and <coughs> in a very positive way. For farmers, farmers are moving into a much better position. The power in the food chain is shifting. It is shifting, you know, it was 200 years ago, it was landowners. It then went to manufacturers as they developed added value. The last 30 years has been the period of the retailer, where they've been powerful in, 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 in food chains. I think it's shifting the power. It's shifting to farmers because of supply and demand, and it's shifting to consumers because of the rise of the internet and the rise of information and the ability. The big new player in the retail market, I would guess, before 2020, will not be any of the big names you currently know. It will be a major internet player, rather than a Tesco or a Sainsbury's or somebody else. It will be somebody you haven't thought of, unless it's somebody called Amazon. But it's changing really, really rapidly. And for procurement, and that bit in between, security of supply has become an issue in a way it has not been for a century. And that offers huge opportunities. It seems to me in Wales, you've got lots and lots of grass, you've got a great name, you've got a great brand, you've also got tourism, which is a fantastic additional income stream that comes in. I listened to all the talk this morning about subsidies and I know it's really important. The big opportunity here is in the food industry. But to really do it, you have to be competitive. And you're going to hear from somebody who's very competitive, but you have to be competitive <laughs> on a global basis and really focus. I loved your question on producing food, because that's where a lot of the income is going to come from in the future. Um, and as I said in my last slide, the big key message, focus on what you can influence. There's no point in worrying too much on the other things. Focus on the things you can do on your business and where it needs to be in 10 years' time. Thank you. Thank you.